The top stories tonight in Y News. President Rodrigo Duterte approves the recommendations from the Interagency Task Force against COVID-19 on the quarantine measures to be implemented from today until June 30, 2020, with Metro Manila once again under general community quarantine, while Caraga Administrative Region authorities want GCQ back. It may trigger new diabetes, emerging evidence show. Quezon City Pioneers employing public utility jeepney drivers in delivery service initiative. The Quezon City government places two more streets under special concern lockdown. Hong Kong Center for Food Safety tests raw salmon for coronavirus, while New Zealand reports two new coronavirus cases. A simple gadget developed in Germany sounds off its alarm as of saying, don't stand so close to me. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Tuesday, June 16, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Join us in the next 45 minutes as we deliver today's top stories around the globe. I'm Angelo Castro III. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William Theo. First in the news, what comes after June 15 has been answered. President Rodrigo Duterte approves the recommendations from the Interagency Task Force against COVID-19 on the quarantine measures to be implemented in various parts of the country starting today until June 30, 2020. Metro Manila and other parts of the Philippines remain under General Community Quarantine or GCQ. Areas under GCQ from June 16 until 30 in Luzon are the National Capital Region, Cagayan, Isabela, Nueva Vizcaya, Quirino, Santiago City, Aurora, Bataan, Bulacan, Tarlac, Olongapo City, Cavite, Laguna, Batangas, Rizal, Quezon, Occidental Mindoro. In Visayas are Bohol, Cebu Province except Talisay City and Cebu City, Negros Oriental, Siquijor, Mandawi City and Lapu-Lapu City. And in Mindanao are Zamboanga and Davao Cities. According to Interior Secretary Eduardo Año, the local governments shall aggressively implement the localized lockdowns in barangays with high COVID-19 cases. Through this, Malacanang hopes COVID-19 cases will not reach 40,000 by the end of June after experts from University of the Philippines warned of this possibility if restrictions are further eased. Uh, dito ay uh, napagkasundo natin na uh, uh, ang ating uh, National Capital Region na ngayon ay under GCQ pa rin ay magiging agresibo sa pagpapatupad ng barangay lockdown. Kasi kahit na uh, na napapalit natin yung mga namamatay pero marami pa rin positive cases, mga bagong cases sa National Capital Region. Kaya ito ang pagkakataon hanggang June 30 na uh, ma-implement mabuti ang uh, general community quarantine. Meanwhile, Talisay City and Cebu City are not included in the list of GCQ areas. Our Malacanang correspondent Rosa Licoz explains why. Due to the continuous increase of COVID-19 cases and a higher utilization of critical care capacity, Cebu City is put under Enhanced Community Quarantine or ECQ once again. On the other hand, Talisay City is under Modified Enhanced Community Quarantine or MECQ. This is the recommendation, Mr. President, for Cebu City to be placed, to be escalated back to ECQ for the same reasons. Talisay City, a component city under the province of Cebu, shall be placed under Modified Enhanced Community Quarantine or MECQ until June 30, 2020. According to the Interior Department, 
more policemen will be deployed in Cebu City to implement ECQ effectively. The palace assures residents will be provided social assistance for the stricter quarantine measures since most industries will not be allowed to operate. The general public is not allowed to go outdoors except essential workers. Public transportation will have to stop their operations anew in both Talisay and Cebu cities. Sa bayanihan lo po, limitado sa dalawang transes yan. At sigurado naman po na ang buong siyudad ng Cebu at Talisay ay mapapa, mabibigyan po ng pangalawang ayuda sangayon sa bayanihan lo. For his part, President Rodrigo Duterte appeals to the public to properly observe minimum health standards to combat the coronavirus disease. We are gradually easing restrictions to make way for our economic viability as individuals and as a nation. But it does not mean that we will forget our minimum health standard. Ang mabuti na siguro dito kasi nananiniwala kayo sa inyong gobyerno. Well, if not really na uh, sa personally ayaw ako ninyo, uh, just listen to our advice because that's intended for everybody. At para sa kapakanan ninyo yan. Meanwhile, other parts of the country are placed under Modified General Community Quarantine or MGCQ as recommended by the IATF. Rosa Licoz, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Regional Task Force on COVID-19 won Caraga Shield expresses concern over the sudden mounting of COVID-19 cases in the region. The Caraga Administrative Region has so far recorded 32 positive cases. 11 of those are from Butuan City. This is why the Regional Task Force had sent a letter to the Interagency Task Force against COVID-19 appealing to place the entire region under general community quarantine once again to control the movement of the people and to conduct proper contact tracing. According to Butuan City Administrator Renante de Siata, who is also a member of RTF1 Caraga Shield, the new cases are locally stranded individuals and returning overseas Filipino workers who have been sent home to the city. The official asserts that if more positive cases emerge, the COVID facility in Butuan and the neighboring provinces will be overwhelmed. But based on IATF Resolution Number 46, Caraga Region will remain under MGCQ. Meanwhile, Zamboanga City Mayor Ben Climaco has confirmed that the Zamboanga City Reformatory Center is now COVID-free. This is after 14 jail personnel and 62 persons deprived of liberty recovered from the novel coronavirus infection. The spread of the coronavirus inside the jail was promptly prevented because the positive cases were immediately isolated in other facilities away from fellow prisoners. Among the several ways of treating their patients is steam inhalation therapy in which a patient covers himself with a blanket and inhales steam from a casserole with hot water, lemongrass, and salt. Patients were also given vitamins and fed nutritious food continually and made to do a regular exercise to boost their immune system. Mayor Klimako adds that the recovery of all the jail personnel and PDLs can be considered as a miracle. The reformatory center remains locked down to prevent a further outbreak within the facility. President Rodrigo Duterte confirms his approval to open classes on August 24, but the chief executive reiterated there will be no face-to-face -face sessions unless a vaccine against coronavirus disease is already available. The president also promises to look for funds to procure 300 pesos worth of transistor radios. These radios will be provided to students living and studying in far-flung areas to be used in modular training in the coming school year. We might buy the radio at 300, maibigay sa lahat ng, sa lahat ng barangay. Uh, maabot ng radio para naman yung mga mahirap may communication sila sa teacher nila. According to Education Secretary Leonor Briones, DepEd is negotiating with local radio stations as well as with two telecommunications players for free internet connection. 
There is no budget as of yet for the planned distribution of radios worth 300 pesos each to students in far-flung areas. However, Presidential Secretary Harry Roque assures there will be funding for this measure. This is in connection with the planned utilization of local radio stations in delivering education to students now that face-to-face -face classes are still not an option in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Ito po ay para sa mga lugar na walang akses sa computer, walang akses sa television, at uh, ang tanging akses lamang ay yung mga community radio. So kung kinakailangan, bibigyan natin yung mga sudyante ng 300 pesos worth na radio kasi yun yung pinakamura para magpatuloy pa rin ang kanilang pag-aaral. Parents who do not have access to the internet now have the means to enroll their children for school year 2020-2021. The Education Department says this is quite accessible. Dante Amento gives the details why. The Department of Education Dropbox enrollment began today. DepEd set drop boxes and kiosks in place in various areas for drop off and pick up of learner enrollment survey forms. Nilalagay yon either sa school or sa barangay or any accessible area na pe pwedeng i-drop nila at kunin nila yung tinatawag nating uh, learner enrollment survey form. Through the learner enrollment survey form, the education department can gather information to determine what mode of alternative learning will applicable for enrollees. Alam naman natin doon sa remote area eh merong challenge doon ng internet, no? So hindi pe pwede yung online so, ang bibigay natin doon, yung tinatawag natin printed modules. One of the parents who grabbed this opportunity is Nori Burak. She has enrolled all her five children, but the challenge is they don't have gadgets to use. Yun ang ano, problema ko sa ngayon. Nag-iisip ako kung paano ko mariresolve <laughs> pag nagpasukan na. Adults with quarantine passes are allowed to go to these drop boxes or kiosks. Parents or guardians should ask assistance from the barangays for the locations of the drop boxes. According to DepEd, as of 8 a.m. today, 11.3 million students have been enrolled in both public and private education institutions across the country. This is more than 40% of the total enrollees last year of about 27 million. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. A team in England says that emerging evidence suggests that COVID-19 may actually trigger the onset of diabetes in healthy people and also cause severe complications of pre-existing diabetes. Their study continues with help from a global registry of new cases of diabetes in patients with COVID-19. Jovic Bermas, our correspondent in the UK, reports why. A letter published on June 12 in the New England Journal of Medicine announces the creation of a global registry of new cases of diabetes in patients with COVID-19 called COVIDiab Registry. According to the group of leading diabetes researchers, this registry is specifically designed to establish the extent and characteristics of new-onset COVID-19-related diabetes and to investigate its pathogenesis or the manner of development of a disease, management, and outcomes. The registry aims to understand the best strategies for the treatment and monitoring of affected patients during and after the pandemic. According to the letter contributors, clinical observations so far show a bidirectional relationship between COVID-19 and diabetes. On the one hand, diabetes is associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. On the other hand, new onset diabetes and severe metabolic complications of pre-existing diabetes have been observed in patients with COVID-19. Data show that between 20 and 30 percent of patients who died with COVID-19 have been reported to have diabetes. On the other hand, new onset diabetes and atypical metabolic complications of pre-existing diabetes including life-threatening ones have been observed in people with COVID-19. 
Francesco Rubino, Professor of Metabolic Surgery at the School of Life Core Sciences and co-lead investigator of the Covidia project says that given the short period of human contact with this new coronavirus, the exact mechanism by which the virus influences glucose metabolism is still unclear. And we don't know whether the acute manifestation of diabetes in these patients represent classic type 1, type 2, or possibly a new form of diabetes. While Stephanie Emil, professor of diabetes research at King's College London and a co-investigator of the covid project says that studying COVID-19-related diabetes may uncover novel mechanisms of the disease. It is still unclear how SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, impacts diabetes according to the team of experts. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News & Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. And let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of more than 8 million confirmed cases in 188 countries, regions, and sovereignties. The fast-spreading disease has claimed more than 437,000 lives, while almost 3.9 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection. The United States of America, as of today, remains to have the most recorded cases, now at more than 2.1 million. On the other hand, as of yesterday, Brazil has the second highest death toll behind only the United States, which is now at close to 44,000. According to the World Health Organization, despite the balloon cases in Brazil, it is not considered as the new epicenter of COVID-19. Brazil <clears throat> cannot be uh, singled out in the Americas. There are many other countries in the Americas like Mexico, Chile and others <clears throat> who've had significant increases in cases and continue to have an upswing uh, epidemic. So I would characterize the situation in Central and South America as being of concern. As the 364 cases were reported today, including 249 fresh cases and 115 late ones. Those numbers raised the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the Philippines to 26,781. That is, as of 4 p.m. today, we have lost five more patients. But through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 300 101 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to 6,552. Thanks be to God. The Jeepney Delivery Service Initiative gives hope for a bread and butter among public utility Jeepney drivers in the middle of the coronavirus crisis while mass transport remains suspended. But not only the driver, but also an assistant can earn through these Jeepney delivery services. Asher Kadapan Jr. will join us tonight to tell us why live. Mm -hmm. That's right, William. In fact, I was able to speak with the uh, GP driver Ed Pascal, and he says he is very thankful as uh, after being included in the first 30 public utility GP drivers to be hired as delivery service workers. The Quezon City government actually pioneers the initiative to employ GP drivers in the online delivery service. This project aims to help at least some of the 9,000 displaced PJ drivers in the city. William, the program allows a driver to earn 200 pesos from an initial booking and additional 20 pesos per kilometer of travel. What's good about this is that the driver may be accompanied by an, an assistant who also gets paid for carrying the delivery items in and out of the vehicle. On the first day of operation, Ed was able to earn about 1,700 pesos from just four bookings from 9 a.m. to past 4 p.m. yesterday. Here's Ed Pasqual. Okay naman po ito. Uh, malaking tulong ito uh, para sa aming mga driver. Pangalawang araw ko na po ngayon, uh, kumikita naman po. Well, their customers were satisfied as well for having the most affordable four-wheel delivery service. Customer Algen Bernardes explains that for only 360 pesos, he was able to transport his broken motorcycle from Elliptical Road 
to its residents in Barangay Tatalon in Quezon City through GP delivery. Hindi naman makakarga sa ordinaryo sa sakyan to eh. At least yung jeep, kahit ano pwede mo ikarga. Due to the success of its launching, Transport Group Pasang Mazda President Albert Martin said he will also recommend the operation to the mayors of other local governments, particularly in Metro Manila. Yung lala mo ba'y kakausapin ko rin this afternoon na mabigyan pa rin ng ibang hanap po yung grupo namin sa parte ng Magdaluyo, Makati, uh, Pasay, Quezon City, Caloocan, at uh, Nabotas. Malam mo, sa saan man merong po pwedeng pagkakitaan. Yes, uh, Asher, this is actually very good news because it allows people to adapt. But what are some of the basic guidelines in using this particular service since it's uh, pretty new? Well, the driver and the assistant as well as mm -hmm. the customer should be guided as they or the GP uh, driver or delivery service uh, should <clears throat> only uh, transport products or items and not people. The items oh, being delivered should also be set by the delivery service or the de delivery service personnel and they should not ask for any additional fees for the services that they render. Customers mm -hmm. may pay cash, but they are encouraged to pay via the online app instead to observe no contact transactions as part of the new normal. Will. Okay, so that makes it very safe, Asher. And at the same time, because the jeepneys are kind of big, they can uh, transport bigger items for people that uh, usual vehicles cannot, right? Exactly. Okay, so. thank you. Thank you very much, Asher Kadapan Jr., for that special live report. Meanwhile, the Department of Social Welfare and Development, or DSWD, plans to finish distributing the second trans of the Social Amelioration Program, or SAP, by this month. Meanwhile, the agency also urges SAP beneficiaries to register online via the Relief Agad website. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. After encountering several problems like the delayed distribution of cash aid during the first tranche of the social amelioration program, authorities now plan to speed up the process for the second tranche. The Department of Social Welfare and Development has started distributing the second tranche of the social amelioration program since June 11. First to receive the second tranche are the Pantawid Pamilya Pilipino Program or Four-Piece Beneficiaries. According to DSWD, around 1.3 million Four-Piece members with cash cards have received aid amounting to a total of 6.7 billion pesos. Next to be prioritized are waitlisted beneficiaries or those qualified beneficiaries of SAP but were not included in the first tranche last April and May. The DSWD said these waitlisted beneficiaries will receive both the first and second tranche of SAP. DILG Undersecretary Jonathan Malaya says that the DSWD is now coordinating with local government units on the distribution of the second tranche. Para po uh, magkaroon na ng planning kung uh, paano yung distribution ng uh, social amelioration sa kanilang mga lugar. And we expect na matapos po tayo before June 23 sa buwan na ito. Authorities will implement two systems in distributing the second tranche to beneficiaries, a manual distribution process and an electronic process. Manual distribution is similar to the first tranche where a beneficiary would have to physically go to the designated distribution center to receive the aid. The electronic process uses the Relief Agad website to speed up the process of distribution. DSWD Secretary Ronaldo Bautista urges SAP beneficiaries with smartphones and internet to access the Relief Agad website for faster processing of the second tranche. Through the Relief Agad application, a beneficiary may opt to receive the cash aid through their bank account, PayMaya, or GCash. Registration on the Relief Agad website will undergo validation to be processed by the local government and the DSWD to prevent duplicate accounts and fraud. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. There are still no final decisions from local government units and airline companies on the document, documents needed to reopen Masbate Domestic Airport. The airport was scheduled to reopen this Thursday, but commercial flights had been cancelled again, according to Cebu Pacific's ticketing office. Many passengers have been inquiring when domestic 
when the domestic airport on the island will resume its operations. With regular operations, commercial flights are scheduled three times a week. According to Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines, Masbate, the decision on the, re on the reopening of Masbate Domestic Airport might be finalized by June 30th. Even the, the establishments inside the airport are affected by the flight cancellations and the airport's temporary closure. Members of the social security system may now avail of a calamity loan worth up to 20,000 pesos. It may be done online to avoid physically going to SSS branches. According to SSS, it can accommodate up to 1.7 million applications for its new assistance program. Ray Pelayo will explain why. The Social Security System or SSS is now accepting applications from members who wish to apply for a loan under the COVID-19 Calamity Loan Assistance Program. The agency said a member may loan up to 20,000 pesos depending on his or her monthly salary credit in the past 12 months. The SSS specified that to qualify, the applicant must have remitted his or her contributions in the past 36 months with a local address in the Philippines and has no existing obligations with SSS particularly under the Loan Restructuring Program or previous calamity loan programs. However, those who have received permanent disability and retirement benefits are not qualified to apply. Once approved, members may claim the borrowed amount through the Unified Multipurpose Identification Card, the Union Bank of the Philippines Quick Card, or in a form of check which will be sent to the applicant's billing address. Application runs until September 14, 2020. This is SSS way to help its members who are affected by the coronavirus pandemic which has impacted the countries more than any other calamities in the past. In consideration to its members, the SSS extended the loan payment period to 27 months and lowered the interest rate to 6% as compared with the 24 months 10% interest of previous calamity loans. SSS can accommodate up to 1.7 million member applications for the calamity loan, the agency said. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Amid the coronavirus pandemic, health authorities advises the public to be extra cautious, what with the rainy season and the threat of dengue. Aiko Miguel explains why. The number of dengue cases in the Philippines declined by 46% in the first five months this year compared with that in the same period last 2019. From January 1 to May 30, 2020, the Department of Health recorded 50,169 dengue cases in the Philippines. This is lower than the 92,808 dengue cases recorded in 2019. When it comes to death cases from January to May, there were only 173 mortalities compared with the 452 mortalities in the first five months of last year. According to Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere, the possible reason for the decline in dengue cases is the increased awareness brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic situation. Ito ay posibleng epekto ng ating increased awareness na dala ng pandemic situation. Kaya upang mapanatili po itong lowering of cases, napakahalaga po talaga na hindi tayo tumigil sa pag-observe ng preventive protocols. The DOH also reminds the public to follow the 4S strategy to prevent contracting dengue virus, especially the children. The 4S strategy is self-protection. This is through wearing pants, jogging pants, a clothes with long sleeves, and use of mosquito repellents. Mosquito patch is advisable to be attached to children's clothes. Search and destroy mosquito breeding places. DOH advises to destroy, remove stagnant water, and clean breeding places like old wheels, gutters, and in places around the house. Seek early consultation. When experiencing symptoms of dengue or when sick, immediately consult a doctor or go to the nearest Barangay Health Center or hospital. Support fogging. Fogging is done when there is an outbreak in a hotspot area where dengue cases are mounting. The DOH commits to pursue to respond to the needs of patients affected not only by COVID-19 but also of other arising diseases in the country. 
Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Two streets in Quezon City have been placed under special concern lockdown due to rising number of COVID-19 cases in the city. These are 138 Ermin Garcia Street and 52 Imperial Street in Barangay E. Rodriguez Sr. Earlier, the city government also placed under special concern lockdown Sitio Militar in Barangay Bahay Toro, Calle 29 in Barangay Libis, and Kaingin Bukid in Barangay Apolonio Samson. According to Mayor Joy Belmonte, they are applying the strategy to contain the spread of the virus and isolate COVID-19 patients in densely populated areas areas for a period of 14 days or two weeks. Here's what Mayor Joy Belmonte said earlier today. According to Barangay E. Rodriguez Chairman Marciano Buena Agua Jr., five residents of Imperial Street tested positive for COVID-19, while eight residents from Urban Garcia Street, five of whom are now taken to Hope Quarantine Facility. A rapid testing will be conducted tomorrow for all the residents within the area with over 500 families. The Barangay Chairman believes the increase in the COVID-19 cases in the area was brought about by the lack of physical distancing among its residents following the shift to general community quarantine. Nung nagkaroon tayo ng GCQ na pwede nang uminom ang mga tao, ang ginawa, hindi naman pagkain ang binili. Bumili sila ng alak, nagkaroon sila ng gatherings doon na wala yung social distancing. However, Mayor Belmonte says it is not yet validated. I cannot confirm or deny that. You have to validate that by showing na yung mga yung positive at lahat na makainuman niya ay lahat positive. Kasi pag kinontact trace mo, kailangan ipakita mo na ganun na yung evidence. Kailangan ipakita mo na yung sakit nila sabay-sabay na nag-manifest. Bawal po ang magnuman sa mga pampublikong lugar. So ang barangay po ay may kapangyarihan na i-disperse o pigilin ang pag-inom ng mga tao sa public places. No one is allowed to enter and exit the area while the local government unit will provide for the supply of relief items to the residents within the lockdown period. As of yesterday, Kazan City reported 2,673 confirmed cases with 971 active cases, 1,369 recoveries, and 213 deaths. Meanwhile, the city government also released additional guidelines on their GCQ for the reopening of dine-in services of food establishments in the city with a limited capacity starting June 15. These include designating separate entrance and exit points, no face mask, no entry policy, thermal scanning upon entry, putting up hand sanitizing or washing stations, and requiring names and contact numbers from customers for contact tracing purposes. Public safety hours is also set at 10 in the evening to 5 in the morning, while religious gathering remains limited to not more than 10 persons. And speaking of streets, Jago William, we are on board the UN TV radio mobile booth and we are here in Kazon Avenue in Kazon City. Let's take a look at the situation on the road. Jago Williams, so far there is no buildup of vehicles here in our area along a westbound lane. So for motorists from EDSA going to Espana, Manila, expect a light traffic ahead. However, we can see more vehicles plying the other side of the road along the eastbound lane going to EDSA, though there is still light and unimpeded flow of traffic. And for our weather update. Intertropical Convergence Zone, or ITCZ, is affecting parts of the country. In its 4 p.m. daily weather forecast, State Weather Bureau Pagasa says the ITCZ may bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Caraga, Davao Region, and Soxargen. Possible flash floods or landslides may occur due to scattered moderate to at times heavy rains.
Meanwhile, Metro Manila and the rest of the country may experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers or thunderstorms due to easterlies or localized thunderstorms. The Senate of the Philippines will investigate the procurement process of fertilizers by the Department of Agriculture. Agriculture Secretary William Dar welcomes such a probe. Ray Pelayo details why. May nabuti po natin na mayroon fertilizer this time around kasi may pandemya tayo. Gusto natin pataasin yung food sufficiency level sa bansa from now 86% going to 93-94%. The Department of Agriculture has released 5 billion peso budget for the procurement of fertilizer to be distributed to local farmers under the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act. But Agriculture Group Samahang Industria ng Agricultura or SINAG claims that the Agriculture Department's bidding price of 1,000 pesos per bag is higher by 150 pesos as compared with the more than 800 pesos per bag that farmers regularly buy in local markets. Pero kung ang store price mo, ilalagay mo sa mataas, ang anong tendency ng mga bidder, magbibid ng mataas. Kasi yung ang store price, mataas. The Agriculture Department argues that the budget of 1,000 pesos per bag of fertilizer is actually lower than the surveyed price of the Fertilizer and Pesticide Authority and the Philippine Statistics Authority. The Agriculture Department acknowledges that the price of fertilizer indeed dropped but it was already the bidding period and it also included other expenses like transportation. DA already awarded previous biddings to two companies with amounts ranging from 900 to 990 pesos per bag. We are not bound na baguhin kasi the DA back is merely relying on what are the what is included in the terms of reference given by the end users. Etong mga nakukuha nating presyo is presyo na ng mga farmers. Ano mas uh, the matter has reached the Office of Senate Committee on Agriculture and Food Chair, Senator Cincha Villar, who vows to launch a probe on this once the Senate session resumes in July. Kasi to, kung ang bibili nila is 5 billion worth, ay pamimigay sa farmers, that would be 5 billion bucks. So kung may overpriced na 140 per bag, that's uh, 700 million. Malaki din, di ba? Kaya titingnan natin kung tama yung retail at uh, ano ba yung wholesale, di ba? Then we investigate. Agriculture Secretary William Dar welcomes the investigation saying he is willing to open the records. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And for the news abroad, here's Stephanie C. live from Hong Kong. Good evening, Steph. Good evening, William. And to Diego and Harleen, how are you? Well, Stephanie, uh, I'm good. Hope you are too. And uh, what are the up? dates in uh, Hong Kong as of now. William, here in Hong Kong, authorities are testing for coronavirus on samples of raw salmon. While in Beijing, an expert says that the next three days are crucial to the Chinese capital's battle against COVID-19. There's also the reason why North Korea urges the North to go back to dialogues. All right, Steph, uh, please go ahead and tell us why. Hong Kong Center for Food Safety says it has taken samples of salmon from import and wholesale levels from different areas for novel coronavirus testing as a precautionary measure. The center explained this move comes after reports that the novel coronavirus was detected on chopping boards used for cutting salmon during a COVID-19 case investigation in Beijing. Hong Kong Center for Food Safety points out that according to available scientific information, there is no evidence indicating that humans can be infected by novel coronavirus through food. The center has taken samples of imported salmon for testing for the sake of prudence given that raw or undercooked aquatic products are high risk, consumption of food contaminated, contaminated with bacteria or viruses may cause food poisoning, it added. 
The number of new cases reported in Beijing in the next three days starting today is crucial to predict how the epidemic situation in the city would evolve, says the Chinese CDC chief epidemiologist. Beijing reported 36 new confirmed domestically transmitted COVID-19 cases and six new asymptomatic cases on Sunday, the Municipal Health Commission said yesterday. Based on previous knowledge and experience, the expert offered two possible explanations for the origin of the virus. First possibility, products imported from other countries or places brought the virus into the market. Second possibility, someone who has been to the market is an undetected virus carrier, either light symptom or asymptomatic and then spread the virus around before being noticed. Before this development, Beijing had recorded zero COVID-19 cases for 56 consecutive days, according to local authorities. Now nearly 100,000 workers in 7,120 residential communities and villages have thrown themselves into the battle against the disease. New Zealand confirmed today that it has two new cases of the coronavirus. Authorities say both cases are related to recent travel from the UK. This report ends a 24-day streak of no infections in the country. According to New Zealand Director General of Health Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, the two women in their 30s and 40s are from the same family and have been allowed out of their 14-day mandated quarantine due to compassionate reasons. A new case is something that we hoped we wouldn't get, but it is also something that we expected and we have planned for. That is why we have geared up and continue to gear up our contact tracing at a local level and national capacity and capability, as well as having our excellent testing capability so we can respond rapidly. New Zealand lifted all social and economic restrictions except border controls last week after declaring it had no new or active cases of the coronavirus, one of the first countries in the world to return to pre-pandemic normality. However, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern warned that new cases may come up in the future as New Zealanders return home and some others were allowed in under special conditions. In other news, the United Nations Human Rights Council has decided to hold an urgent debate on racism and police brutality in the wake of the death of African-American George Floyd. The proposal made by a group of 54 African countries led by Burkina Faso was approved on Monday by the United Nations top human rights body. The debate, scheduled for Wednesday, will tackle the current racially-inspired human rights violations, systemic racism, police brutality, and the violence against peaceful protests. It would be inconceivable if the Council did not address the issue. This is why the African group calls upon the Human Rights Council to organize an urgent debate on current violations of human rights that are based on racism, systemic racism, police brutality against persons of African descent and violence against peaceful demonstrations to call for an end to be put to these injustices. According to UN News, more than 600 rights groups have called for an investigation into police violence after Floyd's death. Meanwhile, North Korea's army is ready to take action if defector groups push ahead with their campaign to send propaganda leaflets into North Korea, the North State News Agency KCNA said today. The general staff of the Korean People's Army said it has been studying an action plan to re-enter zones that had been demilitarized under an inter-Korean pact and turn the front line into a fortress. Tensions have risen as Pyongyang threatened to sever inter-Korean ties and take retaliatory measures over the leaflets, which carry messages critical of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, including human rights abuses. Several defector-led groups have regularly sent back flyers, together with food, $1 bills, mini radios, and USB sticks containing South Korean dramas and news, usually by balloon over the heavily fortified border or in bottles by river. On Monday, South Korea's President Moon Jae-in urged North Korea to return to dialogue after threats trumpeted by state media in Pyongyang to cut ties and take military action. South Korea has urged defectors to stop sending leaflets and goods to North Korea.
And those are the reasons behind the news here in Hong Kong and other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. Please stay safe over there. A simple gadget developed in Germany sounds off its alarm as if saying, don't stand so close to me. Here's why from Nina Armilio. Nope, these are not dice. This device could actually help you combat COVID-19. In the workplace of Phytech, a German electronics manufacturer, social distancing markers are not that effective due to their dynamic processes. Technical CEO of Phytech, Bodo Huber, says this device is their solution to keep safe distance among employees. Considering safe distance and being able to trace the pandemic movements, they developed the distancer. The device is designed to be worn around the neck. Phytex says the wearable gadget enables highly accurate face-to-face -face separation measurements to be made with much more certainty and accuracy than other COVID-19 wearables. The company claims that its device can avoid the unnecessary testing of employees who may have worked within the vicinity of an infected colleague but did not actually breach the recommended 2-meter social distancing rule. The device is designed to automatically record whenever two employees wearing the device come within 1.5 meters or less of each other and for how long. Phytek points out that this data are stored locally and would only be uploaded via encrypted Bluetooth communication to a customer's own company. According to lead developer Martin Podolsky, the device is clearly different as it uses ultra-wideband, which measures the time the signal takes to travel from one distancer to another and back again. This is a very precise measuring method. That means exactly how far the other distancer is can be known. We offer an evaluation program with which you can find out exactly which distancers have come too close for how long. This means that in the event of an infection, I can tell very precisely which employees may have been infected and which not. Phytech currently offers the simple device for around 110 euros and a version with tracking possibilities for 160 euros. Nina Armilio. UN TV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news June 16, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Angelo Castro III. And I am William Theo. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening, everyone.